if the power of the right to vote was truly made available to everyone in America, it would change the future of this nation. In 2019, I got a call asking if I'd be interested in taking a meeting with Stacey Abrams. And of course, I nearly fell off my chair. I was like, are you kidding me? Give it up for your next governor. Ladies and gentlemen, Stacey Abrams! Stacey was at first very reluctant to have herself at the center of the film. She said, I do not want this to be the Stacey Abrams film. This is a film about the fight for the right to vote. After Stacey's 2018 run in Georgia, many filmmakers approached her to tell that story. And so when she met with Liz and I, she said, I don't want this to be about me. It is the story of how the people of Georgia have been cheated. We anticipated that voter suppression was going to be instrumental in Ryan Kemp's campaign, and we were right. There's always that concern if you focus solely on one character that you're not able to kind of pull up to the 5,000 foot purview and, and look at the bigger history and how that bigger history has informed this moment. Her story needed to be the, the beating heart, the spine of our story, that single story from which we could jump back into history and say, this is how we got to now. So Stacy's story could not be written off as some aberration, some anomaly. You see it as the perfect expression of hundreds of years of history. Jim Crow 2.0, that's what we're saying. States implement voter suppression laws all across the country. Things like new voter ID laws purging. You're knocked off the rolls. Changing the voting boundaries. In the United States, the right to vote is the only right you can lose simply for not using it. In our history, in these periods of expansion of the franchise, where more people are brought into the democratic conversation, after a period of time, there is this snapback and a retrenchment and a cracking down on that power. We've been in line for five hours. They said, you've already voted. Looks like several days ago. No, I would have remembered that. Thousands of people were told no and didn't have the authority to demand better. The system that is supposed to protect our democracy didn't work the way it was supposed to. It necessitated this kind of divide and conquer approach. We would be sharing images and FaceTiming. In terms of the style, we wanted to be consistent. So we worked with our DP, Wolfgang Held, to develop a very specific look for the interviews, specific camera angles, and we shot them on a green screen and then later went back and shot the plates. Working with green screen allowed us to seamlessly shoot our interviews all over and to choose back plates that we thought were in keeping with uh, the subject. So for example, what you see behind Stacy is kind of a reflection of her. We're in a library, it is grand. For the archival research, we really wanted to bring a feeling of archival verite to the filmmaking. So even though these were stories that, you know, might have happened in the past that we weren't shooting, that we were licensing, we wanted it to feel fresh. Something that was really important for us was to find images, footage that had not been seen before, but also personal testimonials. You know, one of my favorite sections in the civil rights movement are from people shot in the 60s who are bearing witness to the history. It's not archival footage, but I think that's a reason why our interview with Andrew Young was so important. He's one of the last remaining lions who was there uh, and instrumental to the civil rights movement. And his recounting of Bloody Sunday, you know, really transports the, the viewer so intimately and empathetically to that moment. It was ruthless and brutal and, and criminal, but it was what it was what changed the South on voting rights. A lot of documentary films use animation. 
We chose to do so in our film specifically for a couple of moments that we had no archival footage for. Rather than using talking heads, we wanted to inhabit the psychology of those stories in a more creatively expressive way. For the story of Maceo Snipes, a black man coming back after World War II, having fought the fascists, wanting to vote in his own country, who's murdered for doing so. There is one picture of Maceo Snipes. We wanted to tell a really full story of this man. So we engaged our wonderful illustrator, Diana Ejeta, to bring that story to life. Election Day terrorism was designed to provide the kind of intimidation that said, if all of the pieces of the Mississippi plan can't stop you, we've got some bullets and a rope that will. I attended Avondale High School, and I became the valedictorian of my high school. When you're valedictorian in Georgia, you get invited to meet the governor of Georgia. So as Stacy, as a young high school valedictorian, goes to the governor's mansion and is denied access, and the guard tells her and her family, no, you're not on the list, and he won't even look at the list, and her animated figure shrinks away. It really gives you a, a sense of what it must have felt to be young Stacy and to be so intimidated and to have her family disrespected. We finished our last interviews in the beginning of March. A week later, our entire post-production had to pivot to virtual working. And um, as we were editing, we certainly saw that there was a necessity to find moments to include what it meant to exercise the vote during a pandemic. We did want to include images of voting during COVID because I think 2020's election is an important beat on that timeline. COVID was part of it. These unprecedented claims of fraud during the election were part of it. So we did want to have images of a new layer of um, voting struggles based upon a global pandemic. The story is evergreen. It's not just about what happened with the U.S. Postal Service. It is this long power play of who controls the access to the franchise. Uh, can our votes be counted? And what does that playbook do to our democracy? There are still forces that are determined to keep citizens from voting. Unless we fight for the right to vote, our democracy is put at risk. The fight over voting rights is ultimately about power. The states have figured out how to stop African Americans, Hispanics, Asian Americans, the young and the poor from voting. We've got a lot of work to do. We're trying to make history. The table about to turn. The table about to turn. The table about to turn. Yeah. Uh, I've been flipping through my timeline. Janelle Monet wrote Turntables as our end title song, taking the energy of the film and her art, her activism, and pouring it all into a song that's also an anthem that speaks to change, to the table turning. Liberation, elevation, education, America. I think it's a perfect alignment with Stacy's story where the struggle is real and ongoing, but we're hopeful. But the song also doesn't sugarcoat the struggle. She talks about raising her fist and, and the fight and the lies that Americans have been told, but it does give us hope. I will not concede because the erosion of our democracy is not right. History is never a straight line. It's always a fight. We have taken people on this history. We have ended on the hopeful note. But now I think the lingering question is, what do we do?
It's about the right to vote. There are a lot of people who take it for granted, but then when they see that somebody's trying to mess with them and take it away from them, it's gonna make them mad and want to show up. And I think that that was also part of the, um, the raison d'etre of the film. The vote matters. You belong. You have value.